There is a garden, there is a city, and there's a kingdom of God. And it is beautiful, and he is bringing it right now into our midst. Thanks again for joining us at Living Word Online as we are in our last message on our Faith Work series as we're doing a pretty deep dive into the book of James. And as we're going through the message, I also want you to remember that uh, this is a healing service and at any point during the message, if there's anything that God is prompting on your heart that you want prayer for, if you are online, you want to connect with our online host, please do that. We just want you to be in a prayerful a healing mode this entire service. So what I want to do uh, is just take a moment and read the main text that we're going to look at. There'll be a few others we'll add in, but I want to begin with uh, verse 7 of James chapter 5, where he says, Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits uh, for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Uh, don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you too will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord, as you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. And you have heard of Job's perseverance and seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. So what's going on that brings forth these words from James? I'm always asking, you know, what's the context? What's the situation that uh, writers are addressing? And these scattered, dispersed believers have that situation. So I'll describe what they're experiencing. I think we have something very similar going on as well. S second thing we'll do today is ask, what do they need in light of the situation that they're in? Because their experience requires a certain kind of response from them. And the response is going to be like a really specific character response. There's like a, 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 a virtue cluster, uh, four key words that James uses. And so I'll show you what they are. You know, we, I think we need that today as much as they did. And, and then here's the last thing we're going to look at, and we'll actually spend our most time on this, and that is the question of motivation. Just because we know what we need to do and we know what we need to be like, well, that doesn't mean we will be that way or we will do what is needed. I mean, motivation is such a tricky thing. And James provides some really great motivational help. Okay, so first, here's the situation that they are in. Very simply, it's suffering. They are suffering for their faith. Uh, by the way, the very words of virtue that James chooses uh, kind of let us know that there's some suffering for faith going on. But he also says very directly in verse 10, you know, patience in the face of suffering. That's going to be important, patience in the face of suffering. So, you know, James has actually circled back to the very opening words of, of his letter that we looked at uh, in the very first week. I mean, let, me take, let me take you back to those words for a moment. In the chapter 1, uh, verses uh, 2, 3, and 4, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Okay, they're, they're, they're facing trials, in this case, the trial of suffering. And James wants them to remember that the testing that goes on in that, that, that trial is going to, uh, their faith is going to just produce perseverance. They want perseverance to keep on working out so they're going to be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So that's what's, uh, that's what's going on here. So that's a situation that they're in, trials of many kinds. Um, suffering for their faith is just one of those trials. Uh, by the way, you remember Acts chapter 8, verse 1? We talked about that, I think, on our first Wednesday night. It might even be in our devotional. So Acts, uh, Acts chapter 8, verse 1, a great persecution rose that scattered uh, these early Jewish Christians. Uh, that was in 36 AD. Now, James was written sometime in the decade of the 50s, maybe even as late as like 60 or 62 AD. In 67 AD, Nero launches a persecution against the church. Now, that's really contained in Rome, but there's, there's rumblings of it everywhere. Peter is going to die in 64 to 68 as a murder, some, sometime in this couple of years. And the Apostle Paul will be martyred uh, 66 to 67 AD. In, in other words, it's rough going and it's getting rougher. God's people are experiencing some various levels of suffering. Now, we don't know how severe their difficulty was, but, but apparently it's severe enough that James has to encourage them about, about their difficulty. All right, so here's some more of the context. The suffering has created some angst for them. Where is Jesus? Why has Jesus not returned as he promised? 
And when is Jesus going to return to deliver them from all this suffering and evil? You know, the, the early church believed in which is just known as the imminent return of Jesus. And as those first decades went by, they struggled to understand why Jesus had not returned. Now, they continued to believe it was to be soon. And so, in fact, in the James passage we read, he said, the Lord's coming is near. Uh, he says he's standing at the door. That's verse 8 and verse 9. Uh, it's coming is near, but apparently not yet. And the delay of the Lord's return was getting harder for Christians to bear. So they had disappointment. They had some confusion and they're concerned. Like, did we miss something? You actually see that in different places in the New Testament. Uh, uh, my sophomore year in college, I lived on a farm with six other guys from my Christian college uh, ministry group. And we had all been reading Hal Lindsey's book, The Late Great Planet Earth. Now, I know it was a bunch of years ago, and a lot of you might not be familiar with that. So just kind of think of that book as an early left behind kind of a book. Well, one night in the winter, I'm driving back from my evening class to the farm. It's about a six-mile drive. And there is this super weird weather going on. And this crazy lightning flash. It just lit up the entire sky. I mean, it, was, it was so unusual. It was so freakish. Uh, it was kind of unnerving, really. So I get to the farmhouse, and the cars are parked outside. All the lights are turned on in the farmhouse, first floor and second floor. And I'm walking in, and I'm not hearing anybody. Nobody's around. I'm wondering, where, where is everybody? And, and then I see there in the living room uh, on the floor a pile of clothes. And I walk you know, through the living room. I'm looking in the kitchen, and there by the sink, there's another pile of clothes. And I'm starting to panic a bit. Oh, no, it, it happened. So I go running upstairs and I see lights on and some of the bedrooms and water's in, uh, running in the bathroom sink and, and there's another pile of clothes and I mean now I'm, I, I'm terrified. The rapture happened and I've been left behind. All right, then all my roommates jump out from their hiding places and I, I mean I didn't know whether to be furious or relieved. I was actually pretty relieved. Well, some of that's what's going on with the early church. I mean, they had these questions. About the middle of the century, you know, 20, 30 years after Jesus had risen to heaven, they, they, they had concerns and confusions. I mean, where is Jesus? Did we miss it? Now, by the way, that angst and confusion is going to intensify as the century goes on. Paul, Peter, John and James, every one of them addressed this issue of where is Jesus? Uh, Peter has some really, really powerful words that uh, help relieve the tension. In fact, there's, there's some of the best words that you can find in the New Testament. Now, let me read a couple. It's from, uh, from Peter chapter 3. Let me jump down to uh, verse 8. Uh, by the way, all the chapter 3 is about the return of the Lord, but let me, let me go to verse 8. So, um, do not forget this one thing, dear friends. Uh, don't you love how, how Peter addresses his, his audience? My dear friends, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Just, okay? The Lord's not slow in keeping his promise. Now, then it goes on and talks about some more things, including the day of the Lord coming like a thief in the night. But well, we come down to verse 14. Uh, so then, dear friends, there's the language again, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this return of the Lord, make every effort to be found spotless blameless and at peace with him. And the last words of 2 Peter is, grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory now and forever. Amen. All right, okay, so, so there's suffering. It's going to get worse as, as the century goes on. There's disappointment about the return of Jesus. And as they're dealing with their suffering and disappointment, they're, they're not always behaving as well as they should. You know, suffering does that to us. Uh, we know character is refined in times of suffering, but before suffering develops your character, it reveals your character. I mean, trials and troubles, they expose you before they improve you. 2020 was a time of trouble. Uh, 2020 was a time of revealing and exposing what's inside of us. You know, when, when you're not suffering, you can actually hold some of the bad stuff down inside of you. Now you can kind of keep it under control, you can manage it somewhat, but when times start to get harder, our self-management strategies, they just stop working. And then the real you comes out. You know, stress, disappointment, frustration, they sort of boil over into bad behaviors, and that always means bad relationship patterns. That's exactly what's going on for the churches that James is writing to. 
and apparently there was a lot of grumbling and complaining going on. So, so James says, don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters. You know, that's one of the first things to spill out of us when life is hard. We complain and we grumble. We get irritable, we get grouchy. You know, grumbling is one thing, grouchy is another. You know, grouchy followers of Jesus. I mean, I know all about being grouchy. It's been rumored that occasionally, once or twice, I can get grumpy and grouchy. I, um, I actually have one of the, uh, the seven dwarves, a grumpy, a, a grumpy, grouchy figurine that sits on my desk. I always see it. Some people ask, what would Jesus do? Some other people seem to ask, what would grumpy do? My grumpy figure reminds me to talk to Jesus instead of grumpy. So that's the context. That's their situation. Suffering and hardship, and some of it's severe. Disappointment and confusion, and wondering, where is Jesus? Grumbling, complaining, irritated, and grouchy. It sounds an awful lot like 2020. So, now with that situation clarified, James moves on and talks about, well, here's the character you need in times like that. He's got, a, he's got a, a good word about the character. In times like that, uh, in times like what we're having today, um, they needed and we need a certain kind of character or virtue. Now, James in this passage uh, mentions four different things. He, um, he talks about patience. He mentions patience four times. Uh, verse 7, verse 8, uh, there in verse 10. He talks about waiting two times. Uh, actually, one time he puts them together, waiting patiently. He talks about perseverance twice. By the way, in another one of my favorite translations, it's the ESV, they use the word steadfastness. Now, that's a good word. And, and then James talks about stand firm. And, and let me just give you one more thought about that. You, you know, the actual more literal and probably better translation for stand firm is this, strengthen your heart or establish your heart. See, that's what you do when you stand firm. By the way, you know, it's, not, it's not so much how you, how you place your feet, it's how you plant your heart. Man, that is quite a virtue cluster that James just gave. Patient, persevering, waiting, steadfast, standing firm with your heart set. You know, when we, um, when we did our character series, man, it seems forever ago, uh, we used, uh, also used some words like grit and resilience. You know, the words that James uses and add in there grit and resilience. I mean, all those words are describing as kind of a, a spiritual and emotional stamina. And of course, this is j just Jesus-like character. It's kind of character that grows out of relationship with Jesus. It grows out of worship. It grows out of prayer. It grows out of spending time in the Word and, and, and then doing the Word. All those things help us set our heart and fix our eyes on Jesus. So, uh, if and when these qualities are lacking, it just means we need more Jesus. More Jesus. All, all through 2020, we kept saying that the spiritual life that was enough for us in February 2020, it would not be nearly enough in December 2020. When life is harder, when disappointments are greater, and when, when irritation is easier, then we need more Jesus. And 2021 is already shaping up to be a more Jesus kind of year. All right, so... How do we get more of Jesus so we can get more of the character of Jesus that we need for living in tough times and disappointing times and irritating times? You know, they, they need motivation. And, and James knows, as, as you and I know, I mean, it's not easy to get these things. They, they have to be grown. But we do need motivation to keep at it and to become more like Jesus. You know, do you ever wonder why that is? You would think that, that we would automatically have all the motivation we need to become more virtuous, to be more like Jesus. I mean, you think it would be automatic. Uh, more Jesus and more like Jesus. Pretty clear, right? As far as I can remember, I have never had anyone ever come to me and say, Pastor Brian, I would really like to become more wishy-washy in my faith. I'm just too rock solid. I've never had anybody say to me, uh, I could use five simple steps to being impatient with my family. I'm just simply too good and too kind to them. Uh, or I've never had anybody come and say, hey, Pastor Brian, can you help me become an angrier person? I just know that nice doesn't work anymore. And of course we don't ask for help in those kinds of things. I mean, in most cases, we know that those things are bad for us and, and bad for others, so we don't need any help doing them. 
Remember earlier, a couple weeks ago, I, I used the language that we kind of slip slide away. We slip, we slip slide right into these kinds of bad behaviors. I mean, what we, we need motivation to wait patiently, to endure with strength, to stand firm, to love well, and to keep following Jesus when times are hard. I mean, we need, we need motivation to do those things. So, <clears throat> James gives us some motivations. Uh, six of them. I, I'll, I'll give you all of them briefly, but there's six of them. They're all good. Number one is Jesus is returning. You know, the return of the king. You know, the king will return. I mean, no, he's not, he's not re returned yet, but yes, he will. When? Well, we're not sure, but soon. Remember that old spiritual? Soon, very soon, we are going to see the king. That was an old on the crash song. I, mean, I love that song. But as we all know, it turned out that Jesus was not returning yet, and not in 10 years, and not even in 20 years. And by the end of the century, when John had a vision that became the book of Revelation, they were still waiting. Peter's insight that a thousand years is as one day and one day as a thousand years, man, that was right on. Heaven's timetable is not Earth's timetable. So John had and wrote down a revelation. John says, I saw heaven standing open. And that's going to be our new sermon series that begins next week. We're going to spend February and March studying the book of Revelation on Sundays. We're going to have a weekly devotional to walk you through every chapter in the book of Revelation. We have our midweek study to go even deeper. I mean, I'm really excited about the series. It starts next week on, on the 7th. And that's also when we go back to two services. You know, lots more information about that on the website. <clears throat> so, this returning King Jesus is also the just judge of all the earth. <clears throat> James says that judge is standing at the door. Now, <clears throat> as he needs, James is going to use this biblical truth that God, that Jesus, is also a judge. He's going to use that to motivate us to good behavior. Now, remember, the main motivation Jesus prefers to use, I prefer to use, is, is love. You know, it's the second greatest command. You know, live in love with one another. Let love be your primary motivation. But sometimes when our motivation to love is weak, well, James knows we need another reality, and that, that's the reality of God, who's the just judge, and he is going to judge your life. Man, we don't like that language, but it's so biblical. By the way, that was a, that was a big motivation in, in chapter 4. You can go and read a couple of verses there, but he's just talking about, you know, brothers and sisters, you know, don't, don't slander one another. He kind of, kind of gets into this, if you're slandering one, one another, you're actually speaking against, uh, speaking against the law itself. You're sort of judging the law, and, and you're just not doing what you need to do. You can check that out in chapter 4. I think it's verse 11 and, uh, and verse 12. But, but James is using this language of judgment and Jesus as judge. You know, you're not the judge, he is. James wants you to know that your character counts. Virtue matters. How you and I treat brothers and sisters in the family of God matters. By the way, you know, James uses the phrase brothers and sisters 14 times in his book. Uh, three of them are in the passage, and if I would have included one more verse, verse 12, then there would have been four times right here all close together. I mean, brothers and sisters, James loves the family of God. We are partners and servants of the King, but we are so much more. We're, we're spiritual friends in this kingdom of God, but we are so much more. James wants us to know we are family, who together we name God as our Father. And if we start to think that Jesus doesn't care about how we live with and love His family, if, if we think bad behavior against others doesn't matter to Jesus, then we need a major rethink because it does matter. Jesus died not only to forgive all of our badness and messiness, but he died to put an end to it and to make something really new. I mean, really new, really good. A new family of brothers and sisters and Jesus. All right, third motivation. It's compassion and mercy. Now, as much as James wants you to know that your character counts and how you treat your brothers and sisters in the family of God matters and the just judge of, 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 of the earth is going to do something about it, that just judge is also the Lord who is full of compassion and mercy. I mean, yeah, brothers and sisters, we've got to get really serious about obedience and the Lord's will. We have to do much, much better. But James knows his gospel. And he cycles right back to the best truth of Christianity that there is, and that is the Lord 
is full of compassion and mercy. We, we talk about grace. Full of compassion, mercy, grace, and love. Just don't use those things as an excuse for, for being bad with one another. Fourth motivation, blessing. It, t- it talks about it a couple times in here. Well, we, we count as blessed those who have persevered. God's blessing. I mean, I want it, you want it, I want it for you. Uh, do you know the Greek word for blessing? It's, uh, it's makarios. It, it can actually be translated flourishing. It's one of the reasons I love the word flourish. You know, God wants you to be blessed. God wants you to experience his full goodness. God wants you to live uh, in the abundance of his flourishing life. Um, in verse 4, God wants you mature and complete, not lacking anything. Therefore, James' whole thrust is trust and obey. There's no other way than to be happy in Jesus and trust and obey, you know, the old song. But I, I get it. You know, the word happy is kind of light. So trust and obey, there's no other way than to be blessed in Jesus than trust and obey. Trust and obey, there's no other way to flourish in Jesus than trust and obey. There's there's no other way. I mean, faith works. That's what our series is. Faith works. It really does. And when your faith is working, you are blessed. And that's the plan of God for you. So, you know, in the NIV translation, which I've been reading from, uh, it, it, says, um, it says in verse 11, this is what the Lord finally brought about. Now, I love the, uh, the, uh, the ESV version, which I referred to earlier. It actually says, this is the purpose of the Lord to, to fully bless his people and his world with flourishing. I mean, that's the fourth motivation. If you want blessed, then you just got to gotta trust and obey and, and do what do what uh, James is telling us there about this character stuff. All right, almost done. Here's the fifth motivation. So look to the examples of others. He says, you know, look to the prophets. Look to those who have endured really hard times. And in particular, look to Job. I mean, all these people, and there's lots more of them, they're examples of those who have learned how to wait patiently in difficult times. They, they chose to stand firm. They chose to persevere. And therefore, they were blessed. Uh, you know, you can find inspiring models of faith and perseverance in the Bible. And the history of the church. And hopefully we can start to find some more today. In fact, maybe, maybe you can become one of those models for other people. Okay, final motivation. James just tells us this is how faith and life work. So just kind of work the process. See, and now he uses another illustration. Look at the farmer. You know, the farmer knows it takes time. All good things take time. Man, that's, uh, that is so much the truth. There are no shortcuts. We're always looking for the shortcuts for these life hacks. We, we, want, we want to do things faster and simpler and easier and cheaper, those kinds of shortcuts. But, but James knows that for the truly good things, brothers and sisters, that isn't how life works. When it comes to virtue and the things he's talking about, that's not how life works. So, so look to the farmer, be inspired by the farmer. The farmer knows it's the long haul. It's long obedience in the same direction. It's the daily faith works, one day at a time, one day after the next. It's a patient, enduring, steady running of the race. That's how you finish well. We're going to talk a little bit more about that on our final Wednesday night about this. And as your faith works... May you hear, well done, good and faithful servant. My dear friend, my brother, my sister, enter into the joy-filled blessings of your Lord, your Savior, and your friend Jesus. Amen.